Hi, welcome to my video. Now in this video, we're gonna do a quick introduction on physical chemistry. Now there are about seven units that uh, we are going to cover here in physical chemistry for chemical engineering students. Now let us start at first unit, which is unit number one, which talks about the properties of gases. Now, unit number one, like I said, it is the properties of gases. But here, these are the learning outcomes that you need to understand by the end of this unit, which is unit number one. Now, let us start by looking at the first learning outcome. Briefly discuss the characteristics of gases and define pressure. So remember, physical chemistry, it is a module that is interconnected with physics. So in physics, we have already dealt with pressure. We know how to define pressure. We know how to calculate pressure. We know how to play with different units of pressure. So here in this unit, we're gonna discuss the characteristics of gases, and also we're gonna talk about the pressure of the gases. And then number two, we're going to, we're gonna to have to explain how is pressure measured and use all the related units of pressure in calculations. And then we're going to discuss the gas laws, Boyle's law and Charles's law and Avogadro's law and use diagrams or graphs to show their relationships. Now, when you talk about the Boyle and Charles' law as well as Avogadro's law, but let me talk about these two guys over here first. Now, these two guys over here, there are certain variables that we are going to pay attention onto when we talk about these two guys' law. Now, and then Avogadro's law, most definitely we know we have what you call the Avogadro's constant. Now, this Avogadro is all about number of uh, particles or number of atoms or number of molecules, maybe of gases that we will be having by then. And then also we're gonna use the diagrams or graphs to show the relationship as much as I said, amongst all of these laws, there are certain variables that we are going to talk about. So we're gonna learn the relationship amongst those variables. And therefore, we're gonna apply them in calculations as well in the, the variation of the ideal gas equation. So now you will see again, what is actually an ideal gas, okay? We have ideal gas and then we have the real gases. The ideal gases are also regarded to be the perfect gases. I will discuss uh, the ideal gases later on with you on this lesson. Now, uh, derive the relationship uh, relationship between gas density and molar mass and use it in calculation. We can do that, stoichiometric calculations. Define effusion and diffusion and distinguish between the two, which is uh, these two terms. We are also gonna learn about these two terms as time goes by. And therefore also we're gonna have to learn on how to apply volume in stoichiometric calculations. Define and calculate partial pressure and mole fraction and use both in calculations. What I love about this uh, module is that we have already covered some of these things such as mole fraction. We know how to calculate mole fraction. What is actual formula on how to calculate a mole fraction. We're also going to discuss the kinetic molecular theory and use it to explain the behavior of an ideal gas. So most definitely here we are talking about the energy of uh, the gaseous molecules as they chaotically collide with uh, each other and the walls, but we'll look onto this as time goes by when we talk about the perfect gases, okay? And then we're going to discuss the effect of temperature on the distribution of molecular speeds of gases, okay? The effect of temperature, um, which does also lead to the kinetic molecular theory to be, but you'll see as time goes by, let me not discuss them with you as yet. And therefore we're going to define the root mean square speed of a uh, gas and compare with average speed. So when you talk about the root mean square, I think if maybe uh, you, you, you most definitely 
took your physics in high school, physics, there is a good mean square of voltage when we did the um, electrodynamics. Um, you will see here it's a little bit different because we are talking about the speed of a gas. But at the same time, we're going to look onto this based on the graph and then derive Graham's law of effusion and use it in calculation. As much as we have learned the differences between the effusion, these def uh, definitions, uh, the, the differences between effusion and diffusion. But now we're only going to focus on effusion when you talk about the Graham's law. We'll also look onto that and use it in calculations. And then also we're going to discuss and explain deviation from ideal gas behavior and use the van der Waals equation in calculations, okay? All right, so these are the learning outcomes for uh, unit number one, which is in unit number one, we're gonna deal with the properties of gases. Now, let's have a look at this, okay? So we're most definitely going to start with the characteristics of gases, okay? But before we can even go through the characteristics of gases, um, here we are dealing uh, with matter. We know that gas, it's one of the phases of matter or one of the uh, states of matter. But before we can even talk about anything as physics students or physical chemistry students, uh, chemistry students, we're going to have to learn what is matter. We know that anything that occupies space and has its own mass. That's what you call matter. Now, there are three classical states of matter. It's gas, solid and liquid but for now because we're going to deal with the characteristics of gases we're just going to talk about the gases as it is now why do we study gases why study gases why do we need gases for a fact that so that we can understand uh the real world the phenomena of how the gases actually behaves like for an example now the gases are helpful for uh, human beings we know that we need oxygen to survive so we need to make a proper study on these different types of gases and how do we benefit from them and then what quantities do we need in order for like for example we have this uh, in hospitals we have these uh tanks that have the gases that the, the gas pumps so uh, for revival, they use them. So that's very important for the studies to know why do we need these gases. Not only for that, but for many reasons. And then again, understanding how science works when it comes to gases as it is. Now here, we're going to talk about the, um, the, as much as we talk about the characteristics of gases, uh, we have stated that we have, sorry about that, we have stated that we have three states of matter, which is gas, liquid, and solid. But now we want to understand how does gases differ from liquids and solids? We want to understand that, okay, as uh, chemistry students. So now this is the first reason, okay? We say the gas expands spontaneously. We know that, right? Now I can have three states of matter, say for an example, I have three beakers represented over here, okay? And therefore in this beaker, the particles or the molecules of this substance over here are a little bit tightly packed from one another. But here, let's say the particles are tightly, 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 tightly packed in this container. But say here, these particles are placed far apart from one another. So now what is happening is that here we have a gas and then here we have a liquid and then here we have a solid whereby the particles are tightly packed. And then here, these particles, they move relative, uh, relatively uh, with the container. And then here the particles, they freely move around in this container. So now the gases differ from liquids and solid because we say they expand spontaneously. When we say they expand spontaneously, we simply mean that they can maneuver around this container, moving freely, relatively freely around this container by occupying a larger volume in this container. Okay, that's why we can simply say that uh, that's how we can note the differences between the gas uh, the, the differences of gas between the from uh, liquids and solids, okay? Another difference is that they can be readily compressed, which is true. One, uh, say again, I have a compressor placed in this container, right? Um, let me just write it in this way. Let's say I have a compressor placed on this container. When I apply a force on this compressor to move downwards, 
what is going to happen? These gaseous particles will also be pushed downwards and they will cluster at the bottom of this container. So now this is what I want you to pay attention on to. So now the initial volume of these gas particles, say for an example, it was zero comma, I'm just making an example, it was 0 0.5 cubic decimeter. But for a fact that you pressed your compressor downwards to compress these air molecules or these gas molecules. Now, what is happening with the volume? The volume has decreased. Now, the volume could be 0 0.2 cubic decimeters. So now, when you compress the gas molecules, you decrease their volume. And therefore, these gaseous molecules, we say they are under high pressure. So that means the gases they can be readily compressed compared to liquids and solids. You cannot compress a liquid. If maybe you have a compressor in this uh, place on this container, and then maybe let's say you want to compress this. Okay, sure, fine. This is what is going to happen. The liquid, it won't be compressed. Why? Because it will be the, the, the particles that are not far apart from one another, whereby you can just squeeze them. And then you say, now I managed to de uh, compress my liquid. It's not easy to compress a liquid. Okay. Same applies to solid, which is quite well obvious. Does it make sense? So that's why we say gases differ from liquids by uh, from liquids and solids by saying that the gases can be readily compressed. Another difference is that gases occupy far more space than the liquids or solid from which they form, which is what I have already talked about when you talked about the, that they expand spontaneously by filling the water container. The gases can also, we can say, they occupy far more space. I mean, like the gaseous particles, they are placed far apart from one another, but the, the, the particles or the molecules of water, they, they, they are close from one another, even though they are not that close, close, but this one are tightly packed tightly packed so hence why we can say gases occupy far more space than the sub uh, the, than these substances which is uh, in liquid state and solid state okay again we can say that the gaseous particles are extremely low when it comes to their densities they have low densities you would swear that the gases doesn't have any mess. Why? Because like they float freely for the fact that they easily float and they can easily rise above. So that means they have low density. Okay. But we can't assume and say gases do not have mass. No, they do have mass. Because remember, I guess it's one of the classification of matter. And we have just discussed that matter has what? Has a mass. Uh, has its own mass by occupying the space and also occupies the space, okay? So we can easily say the gases have extremely low density, okay? Because they have mass. We know that the formula that we use to calculate density is rho, uh, rho uh, is equal to m over v. So that means we need mass to get our density. So that means the gases does also have mass and volume at which it occupies. This is basically matter, okay? Right, so these are the differences amongst uh, liquid uh, gases from liquid and gases from solids. Now, let's talk about the perfect gas, okay? The perfect gas does also called the ideal gas, okay? Ideal gas. Now, when you talk about the perfect gases or the ideal gases, before we can even go through this, this is, like, this is what I like to say, okay? Something which is ideal means it is perfect. Now, say for an example, you have a container filled of gaseous particles, okay, or gaseous molecules. What we know when it comes to gases is that the molecules of gases are placed far apart from one another because they can expand spontaneously in this container. Let me close the container, okay? So now, if I were to ask you a question, say, for an example, you are not a physics student, you just an ordinary person who's not even studying this. And then I'm asking you this simple question, which does make sense. I'm going to ask you, do you believe that this gas molecule and this gas molecule, do they have attraction between them? I mean, like as a person who is not doing physics, it will make sense to say no. 
there is no attraction between these two molecules because they are placed far apart from one another right it seems as if there is no force there is no attraction between these two it makes sense because it's gas and they are placed far apart from one another but what type of gas do we call this if this uh, molecule and this molecule do not experience uh, in the molecular force we call it an ideal gas because it obeys what we see as gas you understand it makes sense to say gas molecules they do not have uh, intermolecular force therefore we can say that's perfectly a gas that's a gas like we know that gas doesn't have intermolecular force because the particles are far apart from one another it will make sense therefore we call the ideal gas this type of gas we'll say it's an ideal gas but in reality in nature, there is no what we call an ideal gas. We're just doing the ideal gas under the studies by changing different variables. You will see as time goes by what variables am I referring to. We're going to talk about the deviations of the real gas to the ideal gas, from the ideal gas to the real gases, okay? So now, uh, in nature, we have what you call the real gases. In nature, even though these particles are placed far apart from one another. There is an intermolecular force existing between these two particles, or between these two molecules. The thing is, the intermolecular force existing between these two molecules, it's very weak. So hence why it's highly impossible, it's highly likely to say, it's, it's, it's highly possible for an individual to say there is no intermolecular force because the intermolecular force is just weak, just very, very weak. Okay, so the real gases, they do have what you call the intermolecular forces, but the ideal gas, which is the perfect gas, doesn't have intermolecular force at all. Okay, so now let us read more about the perfect gas, okay, or the ideal gas. Gases consist of a vast number of molecules, okay, which are moving chaotically in all directions. We know that colliding with one another and with the walls of the container. This one moves in this direction. This one moves in this direction. This one moves in this direction. At the same time, this one is colliding with the wall. They move chaotically in, the, in, in this container. That's what we see as an ideal gas. And therefore, the speed increases as the temperature increases, which is true. Because now, say for example, you place your Bunsen banner over here, right? Say for example, you place your Bunsen banner over here. What is going to happen with the particles of this gas? They're not going to move chaotically into this content they want to move vigorously into this content collide with the world collide with each other and then therefore it will be like there's no attraction between the molecules because they just move like irrationally in this container and therefore we'll consider this to be an ideal gas and then again a gas varies with liquid in that except during collision the molecules of gas are widely separated as if there is no intermolecular force are widely separated from one another and move in paths that are largely unaffected by intermolecular force you would swear that these molecules they do not have intermolecular force because they are largely separated they are far from one another okay all right, so that's what we call the perfect guess or the ideal guesses, okay? All right, so now the state of guesses, okay? Now, for a guess to be in its state, it's supposed to make sense by just looking at it, okay? The volume it occupies, you'll be able to tell that this guess, it is, uh, this substance, it is in gaseous state. I mean, like a substance, to be in a certain state, you will see by just looking at it. If it's liquid, it is in liquid state. It, but now, if it occupies a larger volume, a substance occupies a larger volume, that means it is in gaseous state. Now, here, we are most definitely talking about the physical state of sample of a substance, and its physical condition, like I said, is defined by its physical properties, okay? And therefore, two samples of the same substance that have the same physical properties are in the same state, which doesn't make sense. I mean, like, if one, if I have one and you have one, that means we're in the same state, we both have one, right? So that means two samples of the same substance, I mean, like, from this, literal, from the same substance, okay, that are, have the same physical properties are in the same state, okay? All right. So the state of a pure gas, okay? is defined by the properties such as the volume it occupies, the amount of substance it contains, the pressure, 
and the temperature. If you want to talk about the state of a pure gas, now you're going to have to look at the properties of volume it occupies, okay? Because here we're talking about gas. Do not forget that, okay? So we're going to look at the volume it occupies. We can also look at the amount of substance it contains, meaning here we can simply talk about um number of moles, which is N, okay? Um, even concentration, because we know how to convert the concentration number of moles, mass, all of these documentary quantities. And therefore, we can also talk about the pressure, okay, which goes hand in hand with the volume we know for gases. And then we can also talk about the temperature, okay? Right. So now, what is pressure? Now, here we are talking about the definition of a pressure. We say, we say that a pressure, as much as we did pressure in physics, we still need it in physical chemistry. The pressure, which is defined by this formula, is the force applied. This is the force we are talking about. The force applied perpendicular to the surface of an object per unit area over which that force is distributed. Now, say I have a box on a surface, okay? And then I apply a downward force. This box will experience a pressure based on this force applied and the area at which this force is applied onto. Okay, so make the force on this box. This box will most definitely be under high pressure due to the force and the area at which this force is acting. And this force is supposed to act perpendicular to the surface. Okay, right. Now, that is, uh, we know that the SI units for pressure, we use pascals, which one pascal, one pascal correspond with one newton per cubic meter squared, okay? So these units, N over M squared, they come from this formula because we know that force, we use uh, the newton units, and then our area, we use meter squared for our area. So this is where these units actually comes from. They come from this uh, equation or formula. Okay, and therefore now we know what is pressure. And therefore what is atmospheric pressure is the weight of air per unit of area. Okay, it's the weight of air per unit of area. So now this box is just freely placed on a horizontal surface, but we know that there is air around this object. Therefore, this air will most definitely exert a weight on this force. And therefore, this force, that means uh, this object will experience atmospheric pressure due to the gaseous molecules over unit area. Okay? So now, to calculate pressure, we can use one of these two formulae, which is we, which is what we have already learned uh, in first semester. Uh, when you want to determine your pressure, it only depends on what is provided, on what is provided by then. So if you have your density, your um, density of your object, this is gravitational acceleration, and then the height of that object, you will be able to determine your pressure experienced by that object. Or you can also use this formula, whereby if you are provided with the force and the area, therefore you can use this formula to calculate your pressure, okay? Now, this is the pressure and its units. We know how to calculate pressure. We have already discussed that. Which formula to use to calculate pressure? This is two formula that you can utilize. And therefore the units, okay? We have already discussed that the units for uh, pressure is Pascal's, okay? There are many different units. It only depends on your uh, dimensions you used. So now, here, I'm not gonna do this because I'm, I'm, I'm quite well that you guys are familiar with this. This is the units for density, right? Density, we know it's uh, mass over volume, which is kilograms per cubic meters. And therefore here is a gravitational force, which is meter per second squared. Um, and then here we have the height, which is in meters, you know? And then you do your um, multiplications and cancellations, and then you will end up with this unit. So kg per meter second squared correspond with one pascal, okay? So that means one kg per meter second squared will correspond with one pascal, okay?
same applies to here if you want to do your uh manipulation to get the your you your new units we know that force is kg multiplied by mass uh, multiplied by mass over second squared we know that where does this actually comes from it comes from if you know physics f net is equals to mass multiplied by acceleration we know that this is kg multiplied by remember acceleration the unit for acceleration is meter uh, uh sorry kg meter Per second squared we know that this is the units that we use to calculate force from mass multiplied by acceleration so this is the same thing okay divide by area which is meter squared and then you do your manipulations you get this which is the same as that and for this does also correspond with your pascal okay now the force applied perpendicular, we know that this is a definition for pressure. I'm not going to dwell too much on each. We have already discussed this. And like I said, the pressure has many different units once more. Again, we use the pascals. You can use Newton per meter squared. You can use bars. You can use torque. You can use uh, atmospheres. It depends, okay? Uh, there are many different types of uh, units that we can use, okay? And I hope and believe that you still have your conversion table, which shows all of these different units under pressure, okay? So now here, we have one tor, or we have one millimeter of mercury, or one mmHg, okay? I'll try to discuss this thing later on as time goes by. So, um... Right, so there's nothing major here, and therefore we have the instruments that we use to measure pressure. Now, the two instruments that we'll talk about, that we're going to talk about here, is barometer and manometer. So now, what do we use barometer for? Basically, barometer, it measures what? It measures air pressure in a certain environment, okay? Or you can say it's a device for measuring the pressure of the atmosphere. That's what we call a barometer. And therefore here we have a manometer, which is a device for measuring the pressure of a sample of a gas or liquid in a vessel or a container. Now there are different types of low meters, okay? We have orifice meter, we have, it does also measure uh, the pressure of a sample a liquid in most cases. We have a refis meter, we have a ratometer. Those are the devices that we can also use to measure the pressure, okay? Right. Now here, let's talk about the barometer, which we say the barometer, it, is a, it, 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 it helps us to measure the atmospheric pressure. So now we can use these units under this model. Okay, let me just point it over here. We have this model over here, measuring atmospheric pressure. This is how we measure atmospheric pressure. We use the mercury barometer. So if we use a mercury barometer, therefore, we're going to use these units um, to measure our pressure, atmospheric pressure experienced over here. So now that means here, what is happening here? We have a dish, and in this dish, we have a mercury. And then we have what you call a glass tube. This glass tube, it is a, it is an empty space inside of it, or we can say it's a vacuum. Now in this vacuum, we're gonna, the, the, the mercury is gonna be filled in this vacuum. So now the atmospheric pressure, it is a pressure that it is going to exert on this mercury liquid, then when the pressure gets exerted on this uh, mercury liquid, and therefore the mercury will shoot up in a vacuum, and therefore we're gonna attain the height. So now this height over here in meters, most of the time, we're gonna use it as the atmospheric pressure. So that means in most cases, we know that if maybe it is 760 millimeters, this height of, mercury and therefore this is what you call the pressure but in this case we have what you call the atmospheric pressure of this for an example okay so that means atmospheric pressure is equals to 760 in this case uh 760 millimeter of mercury okay so that's what we do and therefore we can present our units in millimeter of mercury or in torque Okay, so in tor. So that means 760 tor does also correspond once more again with 760 millimeter uh, of mercury. That's how it's just working, which also corresponds with one atmosphere. Okay, and therefore here we have a manometer. So we know that a manometer it is a device used to measure the difference pressure between atmospheric pressure. 
atmospheric pressure and that of a gas in a vessel, okay? And then there is a formula that we know that says uh, absolute pressure is equal to pressure gauge uh, plus atmospheric pressure. Okay, so that means this is what is basically taking place. The manometer is used to measure the difference in pressure. Okay, that means we'll be talking about the pressure gauge, whereby we're going to say we have, uh, let me write it over here, we have uh, P atmosphere subtract P A, and therefore this is a pressure difference. Okay, so this pressure difference, we can, after we can measure it or we can calculate it. So that means the manometer is used to, uh, to measure the pressure difference in pressure uh, between atmospheric pressure and that of gas in a vessel. Okay, again, the pressure inside the apparatus is determined uh, from the difference in height of the liquids, which is true. This is what we did in chemical engineering fundamentals. So I'm not gonna dwell too much on it using this manometer. Right. So here we're gonna talk about the pressure measurements, okay? Uh, which is, I don't think, uh, it's, uh, like we are quite well familiar with this because we have already discussed this, how to measure pressure, you can use barometer or you can use manometer, okay? So I'm not gonna dwell too much on this, but this is what you can do. You're gonna use the information above to convert one tor into Pascal, okay? So we're gonna convert one tor into Pascal. The thing is, we know that 1,01, okay? I'm just gonna use this uh, times 10 to power five Pascals. It corresponds with 760 tor. Okay, it's because it corresponds with 760 tor. So if you want to determine, you can use any method, however, if you want to determine your, if you want to convert one tor into Pascals, you know, here we have one tor, and then you want to determine this, I'll just call it X. You want to convert this into the Pascals. So you just cross multiply, whatever the case may be, therefore you will get your conversion over there, okay? And then here, we're gonna talk about the guess law, but these guess laws, I will introduce them in the second unit, whereby we're also going to talk about the um, ideal gases and the real gases.